right, so welcome to the sixth tutorial on CROC 1 2016 booklet. Last but one presentation on 2016 booklet. So let's begin. All right. Exophthalmos, exophthalmos, that's the bulging of the eye, bulging, bulging of the eye anteriorly out of the orbit, bulging. And normally, who can tell me one of the causes, what hormone can lead to exophthalmos? Who can tell me? Tyroxine. Tyroxine. So we have uh, tyrotoxicosis. It can develop what? I mean, it can lead to what? Exophthalmos. Again, we've talked about some of these things, so it's nothing new. So exophthalmos observed during, oh, they even said it over here. I didn't even see. <laughs> during tyrotoxicosis is caused by accumulation of highly water binding substances within the retrobulbar tissues, the retrobulbar tissues. Name these substances, exophthalmos and tyrotoxicosis. And there's what? Accumulation of what? Highly water binding substances. So the question now is that inside the tissues of the eye, what substance has high affinity for binding to water? That is just it. What substance? Of course, we are talking about what? The extracellular matrix. The extracellular matrix. And if we are talking about the extracellular matrix, then we will be talking more about what? Uh, glycoaminoglycans. Glycoaminoglycans. That is what we would be what, talking about. So these glycoaminoglycans, they have high affinity for binding to what? To water. Binding to water. And that is what is leading to the bulging of the eyeball. If I, if I should put it that way. The bulging of the eyeball. All right, so over here, your answer is what is C. Your answer is C. All right. A patient presents with dry, peeling skin, frequent cases of acute respiratory diseases, exerophthalmia. What vitamin preparation should be prescribed in this case? What vitamin should be prescribed in uh, this case. Now, when we talk about uh, xerophthalmia, we are talking about a medical condition in which the eye fails to produce what? Tears. So, those of you who cannot cry, those of you who cannot cry, I beg, we have to look into your eyes. Uh, from all the hard breaks I've given to Faustina, she doesn't cry. So, Faustina, I'm suspecting you. We have to analyze you and see Please, if there's a problem. I'm just strong. You are strong. <laughs> okay. So, talking about the eye, what type of vitamins comes into your mind? What vitamin comes into your mind? Who can tell me? Eye. Vitamin it's what? Small. Yes. Vitamin so, A. Vitamin A, exactly. And vitamin A, we are dealing with what? Retinol acetate. Retinol acetate. Retinal acetate. So their deficiency can cause some of these things and can even lead to what? Blindness as well, isn't it? You know some of these things. So that is where our focus is. So don't let the skin and the, the, the respiratory diseases all confuse you. No, don't let that confuse you. Over here, our main uh, thing case we are looking at for is what? The xerophthalmia. That is what inability to produce what tears, inability to produce tears. So over here, we are dealing with what A as our answer. A as our answer. Parenchyma of an organ is composed of pseudo pseudo unipolar neurons. Pseudo, when we say pseudo, the word pseudo means what force. So a force unipolar neurons localized under the capsule of connective tissue central place belongs to the nerve fibers name this organ so what then is a pseudo unipolar neuron so a pseudo unipolar neuron is simply a kind of a sensory neuron in the peripheral nervous system 
the peripheral nervous system. Now, this neuron contains what we call axons. It contains an axon. They're going to call it an axon. And this axon is what divides or what separates, separates into what? Into two, or it splits into two branches. And we have one that go into the peripheral system and we have one that enter into the central system. The one that enter into the central system, it is entering into the spinal cord. Aha. Uh -huh. So peripheral system and then into the central system. The central system deals with the spinal cord. Deals with the spinal cord. Very good. Now, of course, the peripheral part will be dealing with what? With the skin, the joints, the muscles, and so on and so forth. And again, don't forget that every neuron, we have to call it a cell body. Cell body. Cell body. And the cell body can be found in the central part of the axon. Okay, it can be found in the central part of the axon. And again, what did I say the central part is? Who can tell me? The central part is located where? Oh, we just talk about it. Who, where can we locate the central part? Spinal cord. The spinal cord, exactly. So, good. Now, the central part can be located in the spinal cord. No wahala. But... When we do that, so that means the cell body should be found in the spinal cord or in the spinal system. Let me put that in the spinal uh, cord system. But when we talk about pseudo unipolar, when we are talking about the pseudo unipolar, they, we can find their central part, okay, in what we call the dorsal root ganglion. The dorsal root ganglion ganglion. I repeat, the dorsal root ganglion. And so therefore, if we are talking about these pseudo-unipolar neurons, it means that the central part is located where? In the spinal ganglion. Spinal ganglion. Spinal ganglion. Spinal ganglion. So please, so that is what we will be talking more when it comes to what? pseudo -uni. Polar. So please kindly take note of that. This is what children in the polar and the essential part, you can find it, or the cell body is located in the spinal ganglion. Spinal ganglion. So your answer here is B. All right. Great. So where are we? Now, a patient consulted a physician about chest pain, cough, fever, uh, x-ray of the lungs revealed eosinophilic infiltrate. Guys, eosinophilic infiltrate. What do we say is typical of? Ascariasis. Good, good, good. So you're talking about what? Ascariasis. Ascariasis, and we said another name for that is nophilic infiltrate is what the loveless syndrome. The loveless syndrome, these are simply a disease in which eosinophils accumulate in the lungs, and one of the diseases is what ascariasis. Ascariasis, ascariasis. So please take note of that. So so all of these things you need to take note of. Isinophilic infiltrate. Isinophilic infiltrate. So please take note of that. So over here, you are looking at what? Ascariasis. Again, we have talked about all of these things. So these things shouldn't be new to you. Maybe those who are new, fine. But again, do well to watch our presentation. I think even in 2015, we had a similar question, if I'm correct. All right. During appendectomy, a patient had the artery appendicularis ligated. This vessel branches from the following artery. Again, we saw this in 2015 uh, booklet. And if I can remember correctly, our dear uh, Faustina 
help us with a diagram. She helped us with a diagram. And we are saying that over here, the, the branch of artery we are looking at is the what? The iliocolic artery. The iliocolic artery. Now, if you look at the iliocolic uh, artery, you will begin to locate an artery. That is what? This one means what? Uh, you begin to find the appendicular what? artery. The appendicular what? artery. That is artery that is supplying the, what? the appendix, the appendicular. And it's coming from what? The main source, which is what? the iliocolic uh, artery. The iliocolic artery. This is actually the superior mesenteric artery. Superior mesenteric artery. Or it comes from the superior mesenteric artery artery, the superior mesenteric artery. Again, she sent us something similar and it, I think it will be on the group page. So those of you who are not on the Telegram page, please, please message me and let me add you there. All right. A patient with signs of osteoporosis and urolithiasis. Osteoporosis, bone destruction, isn't it? Urolithiasis, Stones in the kidney has been admitted to an uh, endocrinology department. Blood test revealed hypercalcemia. That means too much of what? Calcium and phosphate. Low phosphate. Low phosphate. These changes are associated with abnormal synthesis of the following hormone. Again, what hormone is responsible for the production of calcium? We've talked about it. Who can tell me? And your answer is what? Okay. Thank you. Parathyroid hormone. Parathyroid hormone. So as calcium is increasing, phosphate is decreasing. As phosphate is decreasing, uh, sorry, as phosphate is increasing, calcium is what decreasing. That is how they play. That is how they play. All right. So over here, we are uh, talking about what? About the parathyroid hormone. The parathyroid what? hormone. So this will grow the serum calcium through which it affects the bone, the kidneys, the intestine and reduces reabsorption. You see, it reduces reabsorption of, of phosphate. It reduces reabsorption of what phosphate. So for the benefit of learning, some of you should go and look for the meaning of what calcitonin because sometimes you will confuse parathyroid hormone with calcitonin and even uh, calcitriol. So please, some of you to do that and put it on the Telegram page. The differences between parathyroid, calcitonin, and calcitriol. Please do that for me. Do that for me. All right. But over here, your answer is what? It's A. Your answer is A. Prescription of penicillin G, sodium salt, has caused development of neurotoxic effect. That's hallucinations and convulsions. Such reactions is the result of antagonism with the following neurotransmitters. The following neurotransmitters. So, uh, uh, how do I, how do I put it? What, is, what the question is asking is that activation of what neurotransmitter here is causing these neurotoxic effects. That is the hallucinations and you know, the convulsion. And what comes to mind? Now, why do we give gum, uh, why do we give diacepams and all those things? Why do we give diacepam and all those things? Who can tell me? Benefit of diacepam and all those things. Oh, nobody? Withdrawal uh, symptoms. symptoms. Withdrawal symptoms. For okay. seizures. It's good. For seizures, good. Yes. Withdrawal, seizures, yes. But now, the reason why some of you have not understood the mechanism of action. Okay. Yes, you are giving it for, uh, for seizures. Yes, you are giving it for withdrawal uh, symptoms or withdrawal syndromes because they also start hallucinating, get agitated. They can even convulse or have seizures. Good. But what is the mechanism of action? And usually, this is because of activation of what we call the gamma neurotransmitters. Gamma neurotransmitters. So when the gamma transmitters are excited, oh Lord, may God have mercy on you. You begin to convulse, hallucinate, and start doing all of things. So 
this that we give, this that we give, it actually prevents the activation of this GABA. It prevents the activation of this what GABA. It prevents the activation of this GABA. And GABA means gamma amino butyric acid. Gamma amino butyric acid. Gamma amino butyric acid. So please take note of that. So activation of gamma leads to what all of these things that would what uh, will be happening. Okay. So sorry, I'm saying activation of this. So when something is, uh, oh, sorry, let me rephrase what I just said. But I think I just made some errors. Please take note of it. You know, in the in the neurotransmitters, okay. Assuming this is, a, a, who can tell me the space between this? These are this is a, a, a pre synaptic nerve and then post synaptic nerve. Who can tell me the space there? What do you know the space? Post synaptic. Have you guys heard of a synapse? Have you guys heard of it? Anyone? Synapses. Has anyone heard of it before? Nobody? Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. Good. So this is where substances are released from the pre-synaptic neuron or nerve into the post for activation to start taking place. So now inside the brain, there are these things called what? Gamma. Now these gamma uh, substances, okay, they prevent overexcitation. So it's an inhibitory neurotransmitter. It is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. An inhibitory neurotransmitter. So this gamma, okay, prevent overexcitation. It prevent overexcitation. Take note. It prevent overexcitation. So what it means is that when this gamma is prevented from functioning, what happens? It means that excitation will continue to go on and go on and go on and go on and go on, isn't it? And that's why I was saying that anytime uh, Faustina touches me, my body begins to my body begin to get what excited. Why? Because I'm actually suppressing what this gamma receptors or this gamma neurotransmitters. I'm suppressing it. So the excitation overrules. So I get so excited. And at a point, now the brain in the way that it's functioning in the way that at a point, the gamma will start getting momentum and it will also start firing it to reduce that uh, stimuli or to reduce that uh, uh, sweetness you are feeling. That is why uh, Osbert will tell you for sure after that excitation, Within five minutes, he goes back to norm. True or false, husband? True or false? Very true. It's very true. Exactly. So that means that gamma has been what activated to prevent the excitation. So now in this question, in this question, they are saying that these hallucinations occurred. Why? Because something is preventing this neurotransmitter from firing. So that means that the person is overly what excited. The person is overly what excited. Uh -huh. So gamma needs to what release to reduce it. But here's the case because of the toxicity by this penicillin, it is preventing this guy from expressing itself. And that is why we lead, I mean, and that is why it leads to what convulsion. That is why it leads to. Convulsion. So please take note of that. Take note of that. Take note of that. All right. So that is the mechanism of action. So their prevention causes what? Hallucinations causes what? The convulsion. Very good. All right. So here we are looking at what? At GABA, which has been inhibited. And this again is what? An inhibitory neuro transmitter inhibitory neurotransmitter very good all right now i said this because some books will in a way explain it in a way that i might confuse you that activation of the gamma 
is what leads to that. But not really the activation. It's rather what the inactivation will now lead towards the conversion. And that could be because something is blocking it. Uh-huh. All right. Now, a 30-year-old woman exhibits signs of virilism. Virilism. That is growth of body hair, bowden uh, temples, a hey, menstrual disorders. This condition can be caused by overproduction of the following hormone. Overproduction of the following hormone. Now, when we talk about virilization, virilization is simply a condition in which women begin to develop main pattern of hair growth. Male pattern of hair growth and other masculine physical traits and other masculine physical what trait that is what uh virilization that is virilization so of course as a man what hormone gives you that masculine a uh, trait or masculine what nature who can tell me of course your answer is what exactly your answer is a your answer is a all right now, during a surgery of a surgery for femoral hernia, a surgeon operates within the boundaries of the femoral trigon. Again, we have done this before. What structures make up its upper margin? Who can tell me? Its upper margin. We have talked about this. We talk about all the bodies. So, its upper margin is what? Inguinale ligament. Thank you. This is what ligamentum inguinale. Legamentum inguinale. Again, for the benefit of our dear friends who just joined us. Superiorly, we have the inguinal ligament. Medially, we have the medial uh, border of the adductor longus muscles. Laterally, we have the medial border of the sartorius muscles. On the roof, we have the fascia lata. On the floor, we have the adductor longus muscles, pectineus muscles, and the iliopsoas muscles. That is for the floor. Again, I've said this before, like I think 2015. So please do well to watch some of these videos and take your time and write everything that I've just said. Okay? Write it down. And again, like I said, it's always better to view it with a diagram. Always better to view it with a diagram. So please try and get a diagram to help you with it. All right. Activation of a number of homeostatic factors occurring, sorry, occurs through the adjoining with calcium ions. Calcium ions. What structural component allows for adjoining of calcium ions? What component? First of all, what vitamin is involved in coagulation? Who can tell me? What vitamin is involved in coagulation? Okay. Vitamin K? Yes. Cobalamin is has to do with vitamin B12. Don't forget that. Vitamin B12. So over here, we're talking about vitamin K. Vitamin K is one of the major uh, vitamins that are involved or that is involved in coagulation. But the question is that how do they work? And that is where our calcium comes in. So uh, how do you call it? Yes. Vitamin K, we have some proteins or some coagulating factors that depend on vitamin K for survival or they depend on vitamin K to become what? Active. And this vitamin K introduces what we call calcium ions onto the vitamin K dependent proteins or coagulating what factors. It introduces this calcium on it. And when calcium comes on it, it gets that coagulating factor what activated. But the process is called uh, gamma carboxy glutamic acid. That is the uh, that is the factor that helps the vitamin K pick up the calcium ions and attach it to the coagulating factor to become activated. 
So again, you use what? The gamma uh, carboxyglutamic acid. That is the, the acid that we use in joining these components together. But again, the reason is now, this can only become effective with the presence of what? Vitamin K. Without vitamin K, this process will not happen. Without vitamin K, this process wouldn't happen because it requires vitamin K to be able to bind it to the coagulating factors. And some of the coagulating factors include vitamin A. I said vitamin. It includes coagulating factor 2, 7, 9, and 10. 9 and 10. And sometimes we have to call protein Z or factor Z. So, like I said, these are the coagulating factors that are dependent on vitamin K and hence calcium accumulation. It needs calcium to be attached to it. It needs calcium, but it works best in the presence of what? Uh, vitamin K. So please take note. Please take note. So over here, you are looking at what? At C. So if you see hydropolin, what comes to your mind? Just a quick one. Vitamin, what comes to mind? Vitamin C. Vitamin C, good. So collagen fibers comes to mind. Very good. It means you have been following. That's great. That's great. A patient has arterial hypertension. What long-term acting calcium channel blocker? Calcium channel blocker. And of course, you are thinking of what? I'm low dipping. I'm low dipping. There's no fun in telling. You just have to know that this is what? I'm low dipping. All the lolo are all beta blockers, isn't it? But this is what? Calcium channel blocker. Sorry. Calcium channel blocker. All right. The material obtained from a patient contains several types of microorganisms that is tough and then strep causative of the patient's disease. Name this type of infection. Look, so now we are not sure of the type of infection because we are having what? Staphylococcus and we are having what? Streptococcus. So if you are not specific on the exact type of infection, I mean the exact causative agent, what type of infection is it? Simply mixed infection, as simple as A, B, C, D, mixed infection. So when we say a mixed infection, a mixed infection is simply a, a single infection that is caused by a variety of bacteria species. Bacteria species, which are simultaneously causing the same infection. Simultaneously causing the same infection. That is called what? Mixed infection. Mixed infection. Good. Now, when we say co-infection, co-infection means this is causing his disease, this is causing his disease. So they are co, they are all there. So you have this disease, that, that, that's what co-infection. Reinfection means you've been treated and you have, you know, and you're sick again for the same kind of infection. That's what reinfection. So please don't get the whole thing twisted. Super means you have it, it is not gone, and you have added another disease again. That is what super uh, infection, super infection. So please note the differences. It will save you a great deal of time. But again, a patient having the same disease caused by two, caused by two different microorganisms, that is what mixed infection. All right. A laboratory has been investigating very lengths of diphtheria agent. In the process of the experiment, the infection was introduced intraperitoneally into test animals. The dosage of the bacteria resulting in 95% mortality. That means when they give that drug, whatever it is, because they want to know the power, isn't it, of the drug. So the dosage of the bacteria led to what 95% mortality. That means the ability of this bacteria to kill the patient was what? I mean, to kill the animal because they used it on animal was what 95%. What unit of virulence measurement was determined? So you need to know the different types of what virulence, at least 
some types of what virulence. So, but then it's worth knowing that in order for a pathogenic microorganism to cause an infectious disease, it must have some characteristics. And that characteristic is called what? Virulence. So virulence, how do you call it? Does not really talk about the ability to penetrate, but the ability to what? To suppress the immune system. Uh -huh. The ability to suppress the immune system. And I hope you do know that it's when the immune system is a little bit suppressed or under attack, that is when you begin to have infection. I hope you guys know that. Or you begin to visit the doctor for support. Very good. So that is what it means. So virulence is the ability of a bacteria not only to penetrate, but also to what? To cause damage. And by so doing, suppressing the immune defense mechanism defense mechanism and of course if that is compromised what it means is that disease will start occurring and that is what you need to uh, how do you call it no however it can be what we call dcl now the ability the very lens measurement what we call dcl DCL simply means dosis seta letalis. Dosis, dosis seta C E R T A E seta letalis. L E T A L I S. And this DCL, I've not that I'm taking my time to explain because it's a new question. So please take it, listen very well. So the DCL refers to the absolute lethal dose. Absolute lethal dose. Absolute lethal dose. And that's the minimum amount of pathogen that can cause death. That is 100% death. So if they give somebody DCL, or they say the better is DCL, that means that 100%, if you give this, or if bacteria, this bacteria enter into the organism, the person will die 100%. Like, will die. So if you give to 100 people, 100 people are going to die. That's what it means. That is what it means. So that's what DCL. Minimum amount of pathogen that can cause what the death of animals in the experiment. Of course, it's usually used in experiment. Then we have DLM. 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 Doses Letales minima. Dosis letales minima. That is the minimum lethal dose. Minimum lethal dose. Minimum lethal dose. I hope you guys did Latin in first year anyways. So minimum lethal dose, meaning dosis letales minima. That's DLM. Now, this is the minimum amount of the pathogen that can cause 95%, 95% death in experimental animals. 95%, 95%. So, DLM kills about what? 95%, 95%. LD. LD, LD, or LD50, yeah, LD50, LD50, meaning that it kills what? 50%, 50%. Uh, LD5, meaning it kills, what's the rate? Who can tell me? Oh. 5%. 5%. Now, this is worth knowing because maybe in Croc, a new question will come. They will not mention what? Mortality rate of 95. Maybe they will mention mortality rate of 100. Don't go and say this is a new question. It's not a new question. It's been twisted. It's just been twisted. As simple as that. So you should know that when they say LD5, it means what? 5%. 
DLC means what? 100%. LD50 means what? 50. DLM means what? 95. These are the major unit of what? Measurement for virulence. Virulence. The ability to cause what? Damage or to cause an infection. That is what? Virulence. So over here, we are looking at what? 95%. And so therefore, DLM. DLM. All right. A patient complains of palpitations after stress. Palpitation after stress. Just a second. Just a second. Okay. Pause is 104 per minute. Palpitation after stress. Okay. Pause 104 per minute. PQ is 0 0.12 seconds or 1, 2 seconds. There are no changes in the QRS complex. QRS complex. What type of arrhythmia does this patient have? So first of all, what does QRS complex deals with? Is it the atrium or the ventricles? QRS complex. Ventricles. 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 Good. What are the P deals with? P deals with Spinal. what? Sinus. Sinus. The atria. Atrium. The atria. Very good. So the P deals with the atria. Atria. Now, this is the patient complaining of what? Palpitation. Palpitation. Pulse is 104, 104, 104, 104. Now, your pulse should not be more than 100. Usually between 80 to 100. I mean, for normal person. I'm not saying having 104 is pathology. No, it's not pathology. You know, some people can do exercise. They can have more than 100. Okay. We that are active, we can do exercise and have more than what? Uh, sorry, it's from 60 to 100. 60 to, not 80, from 60 to 100. The one says, if you have 60, it means you have a problem. No, you don't have a problem. You have a normal pause. So 60 to 100 should be the normal average pause for every male adult or for every adult let me put it that way for every what adult for women it's about 60 to 90. women's about 60 to 90. so if you have pause more than that it's classified as what as an arrhythmia uh-huh it's classified as an arrhythmia and again if you have pause less than that it's also what classified as what as an arrhythmia but we have to record the tachycardia bradycardia but tachycardia means more Bradycardia means less than the 60. That is what they simply mean. That is what they simply mean. Now, incision has told us that there's no problem with what the QRS complex. That means the ventricles are absolutely what? Okay. Ventricles are absolutely okay. Now, so right now, what we are left with is for us to be dealing with what? With our PQ. I don't know if they're talking about the PQ interval or the PQ segment. Either PQ interval or PQ segment. This is what 0 0.12 seconds, which is a little bit what short. That means it's occurring at a very faster uh, rate. And that's what palp palpitation is. Your heart is beating at a faster rate. Your heart is beating at a faster rate. And this heart beat could be from any place. But over here, since QRS complex is okay, that means we could be what? Dealing with what? with a, 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 a sinus type of what? Tachycardia. Sinus means from the atrium. Sinus means from the atrium. That, that is where the, 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 we have uh, the, uh, pacemaker, uh, the pacemaker or the peacemaker. Some will say peacemaker. Pacemaker, they are all what? Found. So this is what? A sinus tachycardia, meaning atrial tachycardia. Sinus tachycardia or atrial tachy. Cardia, they all mean the same. All right. So over here, we're dealing with, with A as our answer. A as our answer. All right. A patient consulted a dentist about restricted mouth opening. Guys, lock jaw, lock jaw. What does it indicate? And look at it. History of a stab wound. Again, if you have any stab wound or any cut on your body, if you are more than 12 years, what do you have to do? What injection do you need to take? 
Oh, nobody? Titanos? Good. Titanos. Yes, so ATS. Titanos. You give what? ATS, anti-tetanus mm-hmm. serum. Otherwise, this person can develop a tetanus. And that means locked jaw or twitching or, you know, all those kind of uh, irregular muscle spasms. We can have all of those things what? there. So please, you are, or we are dealing with what? With tetanus as our uh, cause of infection. Cause of infection, tetanus, tetanus, tetanus. All right. Patient's systolic blood pressure is 90, diastolic is 70. Such blood pressure is caused by decrease of the following factor. So, first of all, can tell me the normal BP? Normal BP. Every day we say it. Yes. Oh. 120, yeah. 120. 80. 90 or 80? Some people say it 80. Some people say it 90. I think okay. 80. It should be around 80. All right. So we have what? 120, 80 should be. Now, don't forget that we can never have everybody. This, this cannot be the standard. This is just the minimum. I mean, don't go below this value. That's what it means. Don't go below this value. But having 125, 85 is normal. Even 130 is normal. 135 is normal. Just that you are getting close to hypertension. That's all. Very good. So now we are having our patient systolic blood pressure to be what 120 and then what? So that means that this 120 has come what? What does the 120 represent? Who can tell me? The systolic. Systolic pressure. That is what the pushing yes. of blood from the left mm-hmm. ventricle. Yes? Ventricle. Very yes. good. What does the eight represent? Diastolic. The diastole. Okay. That means relaxation, the feeling of blood in the heart. And we're saying now the feeling rate is what? 70. Or the pressure is what? That means it's low. This is low. So the question is that what blood pressure is caused by decreased of the following factor? So now if systolic pressure is decreased, diastolic pressure is decreased, what happens to the general heart? Who can tell me? What happens? So first of all, are you dealing with the left heart or the right heart? Who can tell me? The left heart. The left heart. Why? Because there is a problem with the systolic, the pumping. And what controls the pumping? The left ventricle is... Thank you. Awesome. 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 So the left heart, left ventricle, that is responsible for for pumping. Or that is what gives Mm -hmm. us that uh, systolic kind of what value in a way. Isn't it? So when these values are decreased, what it means is that we are having a pumping ability what problem or that can mm-hmm. be decreased. And so therefore over here, we are dealing with what? Pumping ability of the left heart. Pumping ability of the left heart. That should be what we need to be looking at. So over here, your answer is B. Your answer is B. All right. A 29-year-old man with a knife wound of the neck presents with bleeding. Presents with bleeding. So there's a knife on the neck presents with bleeding. During the initial debridement of the wound, a, a, a surgeon debridement of the wound, a surgeon revealed an injury of the vest that is situated along the lateral edge of the stenocleidomastoid muscle. Guys, what vessel is it? In fact, turn your neck. Turn your neck. Uh-huh. Just put your finger or two fingers around that area. What can you pulsate? Good. So what you are pulsating is what we are going to be talking about. And that is what the jugular what vessel or the external jugular what vein, the external jugular vein, the external jugular vein. And anytime there's a problem with the heart, this uh, vein will budge. That's why we have the increase in venous pressure. I hope you guys have heard it before. Increased in venous pressure because of what? Right heart failure. When blood is not entering into the, 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 the right heart, they begins to accumulate and it begins to bulge. 
Uh-huh. So over here, we are dealing with the external jugular vein. And this external jugular vein, it lies laterally to the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Now, if you turn, the sternocleidomastoid muscle is what is very hard as it moves from the, your mastoid process, then it comes all the way to somewhere around your uh, your neck area or around the sternum area, if you can picture it. It will be very, very meaningful to you. So please, try and then look at it. So over here, we're looking at what? The jugular vein. The jugular or the external jugular vein. The external jugular vein. All right. A six-year-old child suffers from delayed growth, disrupted ossification process. First of all, what uh, substance, I'm not saying what vitamin, I'm saying what substance deals with bone growth, ossification of bones, and calcification of bones? Who can tell me? What muscles, hey, I said muscles. <laughs> what substance deals with bones? Who can tell me? Collagen, I think. No? Collagen extracellular matrix. Calcium. Very good. So you are dealing with calcium. 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 The vitamin D deficiency. Good. So calcium, you could be dealing with what? Vitamin D. Now, what vitamin will be involved? Will be what? The vitamin what? D. Vitamin yes, D. Yes. Good. So, but the name of this deficiency is called what? It's called racket. Or the name of this uh condition is called rickets ricket that's why i give you an assignment go and find out the difference between what the parathyroid hormone uh between the calcitonin and between what calcitriol look for all of them if you look for all of them the understanding will make sense to you the understanding will make sense to you pretty much so please take note of that so yes, this also did it with, with calcium because it helps in the bone formation or it helps in mineralization, mineralization, mineralization. So please take note of that. Calcium will come to play. But this time around, we're not dealing with what the parathyroid hormone. No, we're dealing with what vitamins. Very good. All right, so over here, we are dealing with what C as our answer. So please take note. A patient addressed a hospital with complaints of loss of sensitivity. Loss of sensitivity of the, of the skin of the little finger. Again, I think uh, our doctor Faustina helped us with this. When she brought a diagram with the green, violet, yellow, all the of stuff. It's on the group page. Again, always having a diagram will always make sense to you. So over here, there's loss of sensitivity of the little finger, the little finger. And basically, you are dealing with the ulnar nerve, with the ulnar nerve. With the diagram that Fosna posted, you will see the innervation of the ulnar nerve, you will see the innervation of the median nerve, and you will see the innervation of the radial nerve. So please, please and please again, get a diagram and appreciate what I've just said. The little finger. The little finger. So if you can't feel your little finger, oh boy, think of what? The ulnar artery. Sorry. The ulnar nerve. The ulnar nerve. The ulnar nerve. Of course, it's passed along the ulnar bone. That's where the name comes from. Ulnar nerve. All right. So over here, we are dealing with what? With A as our answer. A 30-year-old patient, patient's blood test has revealed the following erythrocyte count. Six, hemoglobin is 10, 10.55, 10. Vacuous disease was diagnosed. Vacuous disease was diagnosed. Who can tell me what a vacuous disease is? We've talked about it already. Who can tell me? It's a revision. Vacuous disease. Who can tell me what it is? Oh, you've forgotten. You uh, can... like a polycytemia. Thank you. 
Exactly. This is what? Polycythemia or primary polycythemia. Primary polycythemia. That is the name of what? Vacuous, or another name for vacuous disease is polycythemia. And this is simply what? Characterized by an excess of red blood cells caused by overproduction by the bone marrow caused by the what uh, overproduction by the bone marrow by the bone marrow isn't it and that is why over here we are looking at what a neoplastic disease neoplastic disease neoplastic disease or hyperplasia hyperplasia means overgrowth overproliferation okay over proliferation and over here you are going to see a lot of immature red blood cells a lot of what immature red blood cells of abnormal sizes abnormal shape abnormal organisms so abnormal organizations aha uh -huh. and if you look at the hemoglobin content what is the normal hemoglobin it's around 120 Millimole 120. Now we have more 10.55. That means that most of this red blood cells have been produced. Look at the red blood cells a lot. This is six, at least around three. It's around 3.3 .3 to about maybe 3.5 or sometimes to four. But here we have on six. That means red blood cells has increased in number, but they are not having the oxygen or hemoglobin in them. Why? Because look at the hemoglobin level. 10.55. That means they are immature. And hence, that disease has been diagnosed. So over here, we are looking at what? At a neoplastic erotriod uh, <laughs> hyperplasia. Erotriod hyperplasia, meaning immature. This one means immature, immature, immature. All right. So the answer here is what? Is D, immature. Pancreas is on is known as a mixed gland. Pancreas is known as a mixed gland. Why? Okay, because we have the endocrine and the exocrine function, isn't it? Now the endocrine functions include production of what insulin by the beta cells. Production of what insulin by the beta cells. First of all, what is the function of insulin? Who can tell me? Decrease the glycose or glucose levels. Very good. And how uh, does it decrease glucose level in the blood? By what? Uh, I think it promotes oxygen, uh, sorry, glucose uptake by itself. Very good. So it promotes glucose uptake by cells so that there will be decrease in the blood. But when glucose are not taken up by the cells, what it means is that the glucose will increase. And that is a condition called what? Diabetes mellitus. Thank you. Diabetes mellitus, as simple as that. All right. So let's continue. So production of what insulin by the beta cells. Guys, all these, we have talked about them. Okay. We have talked about diabetes. We talk about how mechanism goes and we've talked about all of them. So please don't be lost. If you are lost, please watch the video so you can appreciate all the things we are talking about over here. This is just a revision for us. Now, this hormone affects metabolism of carbohydrate, of course. One of us just said it, carbohydrate or glucose. What is its effect on the activity of glycogen? What is glycogen? The storage form of glucose. The storage form of glucose. So the question is, what is its effect on the activity of the storage form of glucose phosphorylase? And glycogen synthase. Now, glycogen phosphorylase, meaning what? You are breaking the glucose or you are taking the glucose out of the. Uh, and of course, glycogen is stored in the liver. Don't forget that. It is stored in the liver. So, glycogen phosphorylase, meaning that we want the glucose out of the liver. Okay? Glycogen synthase, meaning what? We want to store the, what? the glucose in the liver. So the question now is that what is the effect of this insulin on these two substances or these two, uh, how do you call it? 
uh, actually, there are enzymes. These two enzymes. What is the effect of these two uh, enzymes? So basically, insulin activation of GP and inhibitors of GS. You said activation of what? GP and what? Yes, inhibits of GS. And inhibit oh. GS. Yes. Ah, why? Okay, so yes, now... It activates GS, GS and inhibits mm. GP. Yes. So... And the answer is... Someone say something. The answer is what? Mm. B. B or D? D. D. Good. B. You got is it B or D? <laughs> D. <laughs> D. 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 Phosphorylase means what? Let the substances what flow or let the glucose come out into the blood. That is what phosphorylase. Glycogen means what? Let us store the glucose. True or false? True. Uh -oh. true. It's true, right? Yeah. Good. So what it means is that if we want glucose, so this, now, if we want glucose to be taken up by the cells, what are you going to activate? You want glucose to be taken up. You don't want the glucose in the blood. You want it to be taken up. So what are you going to activate? Or what are you going to inhibit? Glycogen. You activate GP. You're going to activate glycogen synthesis. You're going to activate what? Glycogen what? Synthesis. Synthesis. Good. Yeah. So if you activate it, what happens? It means that glucose will be taken up. Right? But if you uh, activate GP, that's glycogen phosphorylase, that means glu glucose what will come out. <laughs> and that is so over here, your answer should be what? D, not B. You guys are lost. Now, look at it. We said glycogen is storing glucose. Was, I mean, Glycogen is the sorry yes glycogen is the storage form of glucose storage form of glucose so now if you want to store it you have to what use the glycogen synthesis or you want you don't want the glucose to be in the blood so you use what glycogen what synthesis so that the glucose will be taken up by the cells but if you want the glucose to be found in the blood, you activate what? The phosphorylase so that glucose will move from their source or from their base and enter into the what? Into the blood. And that's over here. We will have to what? Inhibit this. Now we have to inhibit its release but activate its capturing. As simple as that. Hope you are clear now, guys. Very dicey, but I hope you are clear now. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh -huh. Very good. So always analyze it. Analyze it. Uh huh. Analyze it. Very good. Over here, your answer is what is D. Your answer is D. All right. This year, influenza epidemic is characterized by uh, patients' body temperature varying thirty six point nine to thirty seven point nine. Such fever. Is called what? Sat fever, 36.9, 37.9. I think I've given you guys the criteria for normal fever, but for the benefit of learning, let me just go over it for you guys again. So for normal temperature, 36.5 to 36.8. Normal temperature, 36.5, 36.8. For subfebrile temperature, sub, that means below the norm, 36.9. Sorry, a little bit above the norm. A little bit above the norm. 36, uh, 36.9, 37.9. 36.9, 37.9. For febrile, febrile, that means fever is there. 38.0, 39.9. 38.0, 39.9. 39.9. 
38.9. That is what? Fibro. Then we have pyretic. Pyretic. Pyretic is what? 39.0 to 40.9. 39.0 to 40.9. And hyperpyretic is what? More than 41 degrees Celsius. More than 41. More than 41. So please take note of all of these things. So don't get confused when you see it. So over here, the answer is what? Subfibril, right? Subfibril. Fructosuria is known to be connected with inherited deficiency of fructose 1 phosphate aldolase. Aldolase. What product of fructose metabolism will accumulate? Will accumulate in the organism, resulting in toxic action. Guys, see, one thing about biochemistry is that there are diseases or their enzyme deficiency always corresponds to the substances they are catalyzing. I don't know if I'm making sense. They are enzymes. The name of their enzymes matches or corresponds to the substance they want to what? Catalyze. They want to catalyze. So you now you have what? Fructose 1-phosphate. Aldolase. So what will be accumulating? This is this is deficient. So what we accumulating from the name? So yes, that's what. Fructose one phosphate. So guys, don't get confused. Don't get confused. So please, all of them, most of them, most of them, most of them. So yes, that's what is B. Fructose one. Don't go and say, hey, what is this? This is confusing. No, it's not confusion. Fructose one phosphate. It this is what fructose one phosphate. As simple as that. All right. A woman complain of visual impairment. Again, what vitamin deficiency can you think of if it has to do with vitamin? Is what? A. Vitamin A. A. Thank you. Well, or retinol way. acetate. Thank you. However, this is not about vitamins. Look at it. This examination revealed obesity in the patient and her fasting plasma glucose level is hyperglycemic. And now this person, it means that this person's insulin is not working, isn't it? That's what they have. We have what hyperglycemia, meaning too much of a glucose, where some of you said it in the previous uh, slides. Now, you see, what diabetic complication can cause visual impediment or blindness? Visual impediment or blindness. So, of course, uh, some of the things about the glucose is that they love to attach themselves to small vessels, small, small vessels, small, small vessels, small, small vessels. And these vessels can be located in very, very important places like the eye, even like the kidney, and so many other words, places. Okay, so, and of course, the name of such things is what? Microangiopathy, microangiopathy. Small vessels, small vessels, small vessels. And of course, like I said, it cannot, it can occur in the eye. If it's, if it's taking place in the eye, we call it what? Retinopathy. Sorry. If it's occurring in the kidney, we can have what? The nephropathy. If it's in the brain, we can have what? The neuropathy. So all of these things, when these glucose get attached to all these small vessels, small, 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 small vessels, they begin to lodge in there and that can cause what? Visual impediment, kidney failures, and neurons problems. So basically, that is it. So over here, I think about the microangiopathy. Microangiopathy. All right. Administration of doxycycline has caused an imbalance, imbalance of the symbiotic intestinal microflora. I hope some. Of, I hope you know that naturally we have some microorganisms in our. <laughs> In our intestine, naturally, if you take them out, guy, you have a problem and you can't allow them to be too much too. So take note of that. Take note of that. So we have what, an imbalance of the symbiotic intestinal microflora. Now, <laughs> this is actually funny, but let me just chip it in so I can help you to remember some of these things. Now, have you realized that, excuse me for my words, but sometimes if you fat, eh? 
it can be very, 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 very it can smell very bad. Especially those that do this, those that are the silence killers. So, this, I don't mention name. I don't mention name. Silence killers. Aha. Uh-huh. Now, because <laughs> the bacteria, okay, maybe has worked on some fermented <laughs> food you have eaten, be like that. So now, as it's coming out, guy is serious. Aha. Uh-huh. So please take note of that. Uh-huh. So just to let you know that some of these things are a result of what the bacteria activities on some of the food that we take in. All right. Now specify the kind of imbalance caused by the antibiotic therapy. So naturally, if you have an imbalance of microflora, what is the term for it? That's what it means. What is the term for it? And your answer is what? This bacteriosis, this bacteriosis, this bacteria. This is also called dysbiosis, this biosis, this biosis, or this bacteriosis. What we have in what a microbial imbalance or maladaptation, maladaptation. Of course, impaired microflora, impaired microflora. So please, your answer is what is see this. Bacteriosis, this bacteriosis, this bacteriosis. So, answer is C. Cholesterol again. I love this question. LDH. What is your good LDH? What is your bad ADH? And why? Who can tell me? We are revising, guys. The good is um, the high density, the low is the bad. Good. So, the low is the bad, the high is what the good. Why? Because the low will carry what cholesterol to the tissues, while the high will carry cholesterol from the tissues into the liver. Low will carry from the liver to the tissues, and that's why people who are obese they'll have high amount of what cholesterol or LDH in those tissues. LDH is very, 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 very what high, and that can lead to what atherosclerosis in the elderly. All right. So what your cholesterol content in the blood serum of a 12-year-old boy is 25. And then it says that there is a hereditary, but there's a problem with what too much of what cholesterol in the blood. So guys, what are you thinking about? Your answer is what? Quick, 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 quick one. No. Low density yeah. lipoprotein. Yeah. Yeah. Low density lipoprotein because there are too much of cholesterol and that is carried out by what ldh during recording of a spirogram a patient calmly exhale how do we call the volume of air remaining guys the volume of air remaining remaining even if you don't know you know this is what residual even if you don't know, you know this is what residual. This is what residual remaining. What volume is remaining? And this is called what the functional residual uh, capacity. The functional residual capacity, or even volume residual capacity, or what? Or volume. And this is simply the volume of air remaining in the lungs after normal expiration. So if you expire. If you expire, we're having what? The normal volume that is left is called what? The functional residual capacity. The functional residual capacity. And again, this can include the excretory reserve volume and the residual volume. Again, it can include the excretory... Uh, so it can include the ex, expiratory. Expiratory, that means the one you have exhale out expiratory reserve volume and the residual volume, residual volume. But basically what it means is that volume of air that goes out, I mean, the air that remains after you expire calmly. That's what we talk about. That is what it is. But I think we have gone to the vital capacity, the tidal volume, the expiratory reserve volume. We have gone through each and every single one of them in the distance. In one of the bases, if I'm correct, pathophysiology, pathophysiology. So please, please, 
it's worth understanding some of these uh, spirograms. It's worth knowing them. So please do well to go through them. But over here, we are dealing with what? The functional residual capacity. Functional residual capacity. All right, so the answer is B. A 40-year-old woman was diagnosed with glomerulonephritis. With glomerulonephritis. Guys, based on her clinical symptoms and the result of the urine analysis. Now, analysis shows, analysis states chronic tonsillitis. Guys, what is the question for chronic tonsillitis? Streptococcus. Streptococcus. So what disease is this one now? Who can tell me the right diagnosis here? Was diagnosed with glomerulonephritis, but what's the right diagnosis? Who can tell me? Come on, guys. Streptococci. Thank you. Post streptococci glomerulonephritis. Exactoma. <laughs> that is the right diagnosis. Post streptococci glomerulonephritis. And usually it occurs after two weeks or three weeks after under treated or untreated uh, chronic or tonsillitis in general. Mm -hmm. So what microorganism, of course, if you can tell the right diagnosis, is it <laughs> microorganism that you'll be suffering? The answer is D. What go? All right. A man is suffering from diarrhea. Summer, he spent his vacation in the south, in the south at the east coast. Bacteria with the following properties were detected. Okay. Gram negative curved monotrichos, but like that did not produce pores or capsules. Hey, what is this question marks? Bacilli are undemanding, but nutrient medium. Hey, so 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 are undemanding to nutrient medium, but guys, but require alkaline reaction. I don't know for this alkaline reaction is what? Who can tell me? Ketone. Ketone. Oh, Lord. I do feel you guys. I do feel you guys. So, of course, what are you thinking about? What are you thinking about? What are you thinking about, guys? Oh. Cholera. Cholera. Thank you. Vibro cholera. So, the answer is what? It's D. Vibro cholera. Vibro cholera. As simple as that. Vibro cholera. All right. We've talked about these things, so please. An athlete, long distance runner, <laughs> during a contest, developed a case of, oh, okay, developed a case of acute cardiac insufficiency. This pathology resulted from what? Now, there's an athlete during a contest, now there's what? Acute cardiac insufficiency. What do you think is the result of it? What do you think is the result of it? So, we talk about cardiac insufficiency, guys. We're not saying heart failure. We're saying about cardiac insufficiency. What we mean by cardiac insufficiency is simply the sudden inability of the heart to pump sufficiently to maintain the blood flow to meet the body's needs. That is what it means by what? Cardiac insufficiency. Inability or the sudden inability of the heart to pump sufficient blood to what? To meet the body's what? Demand. To meet the body's what? Demand. To meet the body's demand. That is what is happening. Or that is normally the cause of what? of cardiac insufficiency, cardiac insufficiency. Now, this condition becomes worse during exercise, especially running. Why? Due to its inability to pump the blood that it needs. For example, if you are doing exercise, that means you need more work to be done to what? To push blood to what? to systemic circulation. But here's the case, the heart is not functioning properly, it's insufficient. 
So if the heart is insufficient, what happens to the volume of blood inside the heart? Who can tell me? There is blood, but it's not Overload. able to pump it. So what happens to the volume? Overload. Volume overload. Exactly. So you are talking about volume overload. Volume overload. So that's what we talk about. The cardiac, so that's over here. This pathology resulted from what? Cardiac volume overload. The heart is so full, but it cannot pump. It's so full, but it cannot what? Pump. It's so full, but it cannot pump. And that is the condition called what? Cardiac volume. I mean, cardiac uh, insufficiency. And people can die out of this thing. People can die out of this thing, especially when the demand is so, so, so high. All right. So basically, um, you, please, yeah, don't go. Yes. The, sometimes it's very difficult to know whether it's pressure or volume. Good. So in some questions, mm -hmm. the answer is pressure. Okay. So when do we choose pressure? pressure or when do we, good. Now, when we are talking about pressure, we are, yes, indeed, we are talking about the ability to, to still pump blood. No doubt. We are talking about the ability to still what, pump blood. So over there, what it means is that we'll be dealing more with what? With, uh, let me say, low cardiac output. Low cardiac what? Output due to ejection fraction being low. So when we talk about pressure, we are talking about the ejection fraction. Are you getting me? When we talk about pressure, we are dealing with what? The ejection fraction the ejection fraction the ability for it to constrict to push the blood out that we deal with what pressure overload or pressure basically but when we talk about volume overload don't forget you are running you are running your body now ask yourself what do you normally pant when you when you run in fact two kilometers i mean 150 kilometers, 50 meters have you be panting. As you said, why are you, why are you panting? You are panting because, Charlie, it's like your heart is going out of your body. Or <laughs> it's been taken out of your body. Isn't it? And you hear that the moment you stop, you want to drink water. Ask yourself why. Because your body is not meeting the demand. Oxygen is impaired. One of it, that causes the pains in the muscles. Two, one way or the other, you'll be dehydrated. So you need what? A lot of uh, fluid. So those who run, they always carry a bottle to hydrate. True of us. Guys, true of us. Those who gym. True. Oh. true. You always carry water. Uh -huh. You carry what? Water bottle. <laughs> because after one lift, you want to drink water. After one lift, you want to drink water. That is how it is. So that means you want to compensate for the inadequate what, volume that has been pumped. So that is when we talk about the cardiac volume overload. But in pressure, we are dealing with what? Ejection fraction. Ejection fraction. So please take note. But of course, I'm hoping we get a question that has to do with what pressure. Then maybe we'll analyze it better. But if you see one question like that, please, let us know and put it on the Telegram page so we'll analyze it one by one. Okay? The person who has a question. Very good. All right. So over here, your answer is what? It's E. Okay.